Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be discussing the digestive system. And the digestive system is made up of a long tube that runs from the oral cavity to the anus. There are places within the tube where it gets expanded or enlarged, but pretty much anything in the tube that is not transported or absorbed into the body will end up becoming feces and be eliminated um, through the rectum and the anus. Um, the tube has a couple of accessory organs that are associated with it and that help uh, with the process of digestion, but they aren't really part of the tube. Uh, starting at the oral cavity, accessory organs such as teeth and salivary glands help us start with our food digestion. There are really two types of digestion. There's chemical digestion and there's mechanical digestion. Mechanical digestion is just tearing apart large chunks of something to make smaller chunks of the same thing. So for example, if you had a ball of Play-Doh, you can rip it apart and make 10 little balls of Play-Doh. You haven't chemically changed the Play-Doh in any way. That's what mechanical digestion is. Chemical digestion is when we use enzymes to break bonds that are holding macromolecules together. So in the mouth, Salivary glands have salivary amylase, which is an enzyme. You know it's an enzyme because it ends in ACE. And that is going to start with the digestion of sugars, carbohydrates. Whereas the teeth, the accessory organs, uh, the teeth, are going to help with mechanical digestion where we're going to just be breaking down the food into smaller and smaller portions. After the oral cavity, we have the esophagus, which is a long muscular tube that leads to the stomach. And the stomach is an enlarged area that is there to sort of hold and store and perform a little bit of absorption, chemical digestion, and mechanical digestion. From the stomach, your food will go into the small intestine. The small intestine is small in diameter, but not small in length. You can see over here that the small intestine is somewhere between five to six meters long. It's pretty long. It's made up of three different sections, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. After the small intestine, food will move into the large intestine. And the large intestine is large in diameter, but not length. It's only about one and a half meters long. The job of the large intestine is primarily to absorb water and help compact the feces. The end of the large intestine is the anus, and that is where feces is eliminated from the body. Anything that's left in the tube that was not digested and absorbed becomes feces. A couple other accessory organs would be the liver, which produces bile, the gallbladder, which stores and releases the bile, and the pancreas, which produces not only bicarbonate, but also pancreatic juice, which contains a lot of enzymes for chemical digestion in the small intestine. There are six different digestive processes that have to happen throughout the intestine. Most of the time they are overlapping and happen in lots of different places. Ingestion pretty much happens where we put food into our mouth. Secretion is the production and release of enzymes and mucus throughout the digestive tract, starting in the oral cavity with the secretion of saliva, continuing with the secretion of mucus in the esophagus, as well as gastric juice and pancreatic juice and intestinal juice in the stomach and intestine. Motility is important. We need to keep the food moving through the system, and this is primarily accomplished by the contraction and relaxation of smooth muscle in the walls of the alimentary canal. We've already talked a little bit about chemical and mechanical digestion, and these processes happen throughout the system as well, starting in the oral cavity and continuing through. In the stomach, for example, we have chemical digestion due to the release of pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid, as well as mechanical digestion when the stomach contracts and relaxes to help break food down. Absorption primarily happens in the small intestine, although some happens in the stomach and the large intestines. Defecation is the release of feces from the body and the elimination of waste products.
Most of our digestive organs are in the abdominal pelvic cavity. And remember, the abdominal pelvic cavity is surrounded by the peritoneum. There are two layers, the visceral and the parietal peritoneum. To make this a little bit clearer, imagine again that you have a balloon, right? And you took an organ and you were going to push it into the balloon. As you push the organ further into the balloon, it would cause the balloon to mush in a little bit and form this double layered membrane. Remember we talked about this when we talked about um, the pericardium and how the heart pushes into the balloon and it makes this double layer. Remember, this is the visceral layer and this is the parietal layer. And because we're talking about the abdominal cavity, we're actually talking about the peritoneum, peritoneum here. So that's the double layered serous membrane that surrounds the um, peritoneal cavity, which is where the majority of the organs in the digestive system are. Now, if we keep pushing this in, here's our organ. And again, we're kind of looking at it down from the top. So if you cut somebody in half with a transverse cut, you look down the lower part of their body, you would end up with something that was like this. This would be the uh, parietal peritoneum, and then the visceral peritoneum would look something like this. And what really happens is this comes back very close, so it makes kind of a double layer membrane with visceral and visceral membrane next to each other. In between there is a space for blood vessels, nerves, and lymph vessels to run through to the organ. So if this was a cross section of say the small intestine or something, the blood vessels and lacteals and nerves that um, are associated with that section of the small intestine would run through this double layer. This double layer is called the mesentery. And it is part of the visceral peritoneum. This outer portion out here that's green is the uh, parietal peritoneum and it lines the body cavity. So this would be sort of the front of the body. This is the posterior side. So the mesentery which surrounds and supports the abdominal organs, the digestive organs, and provides a space for vessels and nerves and lymph to go in and out, is anchoring these organs to the posterior body wall. And this keeps everything from falling down and sitting on top of the bladder and the rectum when you're standing. You can see a little bit nicer version of that here where the, um, intestine is here and the visceral peritoneum is shown in blue and you can see the mesentery which provides a route for again those blood vessels and lymph vessels as well as nerves helps to anchor that vessel to the posterior body wall and also can store fat. The mesenteries anchor the small intestine to the posterior wall. The mesocolon anchors the large intestine to the posterior body wall. And you can see both of those here. This is the mesocolon attached to the large intestine, and this is the mesentery attached to all the different coils of the small intestine. The greater omentum is also attached to the transverse colon, and it's kind of a flap of uh, material that hangs down over the intestines um, and protects them. The lesser omentum connects the stomach with the liver and helps to anchor the stomach. The falciform ligament anchors the liver to the posterior body wall. So all the different parts of the digestive system are anchored to that posterior body wall in one way or another. 
Starting at the oral cavity, we have several processes that happen here. Ingestion, mechanical digestion, chemical digestion, and propulsion in the form of swallowing are all occurring in the oral cavity. The teeth are accessory organs and the salivary glands are also accessory organs found in the mouth. There are actually three sets of major salivary glands. We also have some minor ones that secrete directly into the mouth. The parotid are in front of the ear, the submandibular are below the mandible, and the sublingual are below the tongue. And all three of these produce a watery fluid that contain varying amounts of salivary amylase, which will digest starch, lingual lipase, which will help to start the digestion of fats and oils, water, mucus, chloride ions, and an enzyme called lysozyme. When we swallow, there are two stages. The first stage is voluntary. The food is chewed, mixed with saliva, and forms a bolus. This gets pushed up by our tongue against the soft palate. The bolus of food triggers the second stage, which is involuntary. Sensors in the oropharynx trigger the swallowing reflex. The uvula raises and the epiglottis closes to make sure the food goes down the correct passage. The constrictor muscles that are inside of the esophagus relax and the esophagus opens. At this point, the superior constrictor muscles will contract and push the food down. This momentarily inhibits breathing. Peristalsis takes over and starts to push the food down the esophagus. The esophagus begins at the base of the laryngopharynx. It passes through the mediastinum and through a hole in the diaphragm called the esophageal hiatus. The tissue that makes up the esophagus is stratified squamous epithelium. At the top and the bottom of the esophagus are the upper and lower esophageal sphincter. These are a mix of skeletal and smooth muscle. Food is pushed through the esophagus via peristalsis, which is the alternating contraction and relaxation of smooth muscle. You can see in the cross-section picture of the esophagus the thick layer of smooth muscle in the outer layer of the tube. At the base of the esophagus is the stomach. The stomach functions in the storage and chemical and mechanical digestion of food. There is some absorption that happens here of things like alcohol, water, and lipid-soluble substances. The stomach contains four regions. The cardia is the opening to the stomach. The fundus is where swallowed air is stored. The body is the main area of the stomach where food is kept. And the pylorus is a funnel that delivers food to the pyloric canal on its way to the pyloric sphincter. There are two sphincters that guard the entrance and exit to the stomach. Their job is to keep food and acid from leaving the stomach inappropriately. At the top is the lower esophageal sphincter, and at the exit is the pyloric sphincter. The greater and lesser curvature of the stomach refer to the inner and outer curves that this structure makes. The lesser omentum which attaches the stomach to the liver is attached to the lesser curvature. The greater omentum is attached to the greater curvature. The stomach is also unique in that it has three different layers of muscle, a longitudinal layer, a circular layer, and an oblique layer that runs at an angle. These three layers of muscle mean that the stomach can contract in multiple different directions, smushing up the food inside. This helps the stomach with mechanical digestion. Looking closer at the microscopic anatomy of the stomach lining, you can see that it is lined in simple columnar epithelium. Thinking back, simple columnar epithelium has the job of both protection and secretion. The epithelium invaginates to form gastric pits. Within each gastric pit, we have several different types of cells. Mucus cells secrete alkaline mucus to coat the epithelial cells and neutralize acid. Parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid, an intrinsic factor. Chief cells secrete pepsinogen and lipase. 
The intrinsic factor is important to have because it binds to vitamin B12 and allows it to be absorbed later in the small intestine. Without intrinsic factor, we are unable to absorb B12. The chief cells and the parietal cells work together as the hydrochloric acid secreted by the parietal cells is required to activate the pepsinogen secreted by the chief cells. Once pepsinogen is activated by HCL, it will begin to digest protein. All of this mixed together form gastric juice. The gastric juice mixes with water and the food you have eaten and is smooshed around in the stomach for a while. At this point, it makes an acidic, mushy mess we call chyme. How is it possible that the proteins and lipids in our own stomach do not get digested? We have a few ways that we protect ourselves. We've already mentioned the thick coating of alkaline mucus. This helps to neutralize the hydrochloric acid produced by the parietal cells. The cells are also held together by tight junctions, which seal them together to form a watertight barrier. In addition, the cells that line the stomach are undergoing mitosis very rapidly. And the constant division makes lots of new cells, ensuring that all the cells are in good condition. The stomach is involved in all processes except for ingestion and defecation. So we are continuing the mechanical breakdown of food to produce chyme. We are engaging in chemical digestion with enzymes such as lipase and pepsin. We are absorbing certain lipid-soluble drugs, water and ions. We are slowly moving chyme through the system by pushing it through the pyloric sphincter. There are stretch receptors in the walls of the stomach. As the stomach stretches due to intake of food, the churning of the stomach increases. As the stomach empties, the churning slows. The only vital function of the stomach is to secrete intrinsic factor. All the other functions of the stomach can be done by other organs within the digestive system. Once the chyme leaves the stomach, it enters the first part of the small intestine. The small intestine is small in width, not in length, and it runs about six meters long. It starts at the pyloric sphincter at the lower end of the stomach and runs all the way to where it meets up with the large intestine at the ileocecal valve. There are three parts to the small intestine, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. All three parts are suspended from the posterior body wall by the mesenteries. You'll see that there are four distinct layers. The inner layer is the mucosa, this surrounds the lumen, or open part, of the tube. Directly next to the lumen is the epithelium, and as we've already talked about, generally is going to be composed of either stratified squamous epithelium, as we saw in the oral cavity and esophagus, or simple columnar epithelium, as we saw in the stomach and the small intestine. Beneath that is the lamina propria, which is made out of loose areolar connective tissue, and then the muscularis mucosa, which helps to wrinkle the tube. So contraction of this muscle layer causes wrinkling and changes the surface area on the inside in the lumen. The next layer is the submucosa. The submucosa contains the blood vessels, nerves, and lymph vessels that service the elementary canal. The third layer is the muscularis externa. And in most of the tube, there are two layers of muscle one running longitudinally or along the tube, and one circularly or around the tube. The action of these two different layers of muscles gives us the push and pull that is used for peristalsis and it helps to form the sphincters. We talked about in the stomach how there's actually a third layer of muscle in the muscularis externa, and that's that oblique layer going at an angle. And the fourth layer is the serosa. The serosa is composed of epithelial tissue and connective tissue. This helps to form the visceral peritoneum. As chyme is released from the stomach into the duodenum, it is very acidic, usually around pH 1 or 2. The first thing that we need to do is we need to neutralize the acidity of that chyme. And we do that by using sodium bicarbonate that is released by the pancreas into the duodenum. 
The chyme is released about five milliliters at a time through this pyloric sphincter. The pH of the chyme is raised to about eight, which enables the enzymes produced by the pancreas and the intestine to work. In addition, bile is released from the gallbladder. Bile is produced by the liver, stored by the gallbladder, and released in the presence of chyme that has a high fat content. The common bile duct and the pancreatic duct merge together to form the hepatopancreatic ampulla. This opens into the duodenum. The pancreas also produces multiple enzymes that are released into this area. Pancreatic amylase, lipase, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, carboxypeptidase, proteins, etc. are all released into this area, which is where the major macromolecules all go through chemical digestion. As the nutrients are broken down, we want to start absorbing them from the duodenum. Several modifications to the wall of the small intestine increase the surface area available for absorption by over 600 times. The intestinal mucosa, remember this is the inner surface, is made of simple columnar epithelium. This tissue forms large folds called plicae circularis that help to slow down the chyme as it is being pushed through the intestines. The plicae circularis also force the chyme to be pushed up against the walls of the intestine, where intestinal enzymes are being released. On the big fold of the plicae circularis are also little projections called villi. These are about a millimeter long, and each one contains a capillary bed and a lacteal. Nutrients are absorbed through and around the cells of the villi into the capillaries and lacteals. Each cell of the villi also contains plasma projections called microvilli, which are little extensions of the plasma membrane where digestive enzymes are secreted and nutrients are absorbed. The small intestine also secretes digestive enzymes. Intestinal crypts lie, lie between villi and secrete intestinal juice. These cells are stimulated by the presence of acidic chyme. The intestinal juice secreted is mostly water and mucus, which helps moisten and lubricate the passage of the chyme through the small intestine. The crypt cells also produce digestive enzymes and lysozymes. Nutrients must leave the lumen of the small intestine and move across the epithelial lining of the tube into either a capillary or a lacteal. The way we move them across the free surface and then across the basal surface of that epithelial cell layer depends on the type of nutrient. Some of them, for example amino acids, are actively transported across the free surface of the epithelium. Some, like glucose or dipeptides, are brought across using secondary active transport, either using a hydrogen gradient or a sodium gradient. Others, such as fructose, can move across using carrier proteins, therefore moving via passive transport in facilitated diffusion. If we're talking about fatty acids, they can diffuse right through the plasma membrane because they are hydrophobic. Where the nutrients go after absorption is also dependent on the, on the type of molecule. Simple sugars and amino acids and some small short-chain fatty acids are all absorbed from the lumen of the small intestine into a blood capillary. However, large fatty acids or long chain fatty acids as well as monoglycerides will diffuse across the free surface of the epithelial cells and then be packaged into a chylomicron. These will move across the back end of the epithelial cell surface and will be absorbed into the lacteal a lacteal, and then move into the lymph system. These move through the lymph system and do not join the bloodstream until the left internal jugular and left subclavian veins. The upshot of this are that amino acids and sugars go directly into the bloodstream. However, triglycerides will be packaged into chylomicrons and will be absorbed into the lymph system and carried until the lymph rejoins the bloodstream in this left subclavian vein. The large intestine is large in width, not in length. 
it is much shorter than the small intestine. The ileum is the last segment of the small intestine, and it joins with the cecum at the ileocecal valve or ileocecal sphincter. The large intestine has several different sections, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, which makes an S-shaped curve, the rectum, the anal canal, and the anus. There are two major turns in the large intestine. The hepatic flexure, or the right colic flexure, is, so, is called because that's where the liver is. The left colic flexure, or the splenic flexure, is near the spleen. The large intestine also has a layer of muscle running longitudinally along it called the tinea coli. This tinea coli is a little bit shorter than the large intestine, and so it causes the large intestine to bunch up a little bit, forming large pouches called hostra. This helps to increase the surface area of the large intestine. The large intestine is mostly lined with simple columnar epithelium, except in the anal canal, where it is lined with stratified squamous epithelium as protection against abrasion. In the large intestine, we have several different functions relating to digestion. We have mechanical digestion, as things are pushed and mushed around. We have chemical digestion, where we use the bacteria that are present in the large intestine to help us metabolize molecules and synthesize vitamins. The other important function of the large intestine is absorption. The majority of what is absorbed from the large intestine is water. And if you absorb too much water, it can cause constipation, whereas absorbing too little water can cause diarrhea. At the end of the large intestine, is the anal canal and the anus. This area is lined with stratified squamous epithelium to protect against abrasion. This area also is a storage area for fecal matter. As the fecal matter builds up in this area, it causes the stretch receptors in the wall of the rectum to trigger and send messages to the central nervous system. There are two anal sphincters internal anal sphincter and external anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle. It is involuntary. Once the stretch receptors start sending signals to the central nervous system that the rectum is full and stretched, um, you will start to perceive the need to eliminate the feces. The external anal sphincter is voluntary. This is skeletal muscle. So you can hold this closed for some time until you decide it is the proper time to eliminate the feces. Once both internal and external anal sphincters are relaxed, the feces can move through. This is called a mass movement, and it makes room for other fecal matter to move into the large intestine at the other end at the ileocecal valve. You can see the veins that are deep to the internal anal sphincter these veins can become enlarged due to too much pressure and form what we know as hemorrhoids. That's it for today. See you in class.